In business, the pitch refers to the most critical point of a presentation for an investor. Now, in my family, the pitch itself is something that we love when it comes to watching those things that make this concept a reality, right? The pitch is something that we all know from the Shark Tank. It's something that we hold near and dear in our heart. However, the pitch is that critical moment that can define whether or not that idea becomes a reality and that an investor will invest in. If that investor grabs into that, that idea will accelerate from just an idea and transform into reality. It transforms into a realistic pathway forward. Now, the pitch has its roots and it's grounded in sports. Here in America, we traditionally think of baseball. However, the pitch also has its roots in another sport. In soccer, the pitch refers to the actual soccer field. And at the soccer field there, right, you, fun fact, the soccer field is actually much bigger than American football field. So you can all keep that in your back for trivia the next day. Uh, but that being said, the pitch, the soccer is a game that is the world's game. It's what we know and what we say is the beautiful game. There are several different ways to call soccer, right? We call it football, we call it football, we call it soccer, and there are other several names to call it. However, the beauty of soccer is that it touches every part of the world because it is accessible to anyone. Everyone can play the game regardless of age, ability, or economic status. The game of soccer has this unique ability to allow people from different cultures and environments to be able to connect over a game. Even us Americans, every four years when we watch the US women's national team win the World Cup. Now, the lack of entry or barrier to the game allowed me as a first generation Latina woman who had no socioeconomic status or means or financial means to be able to play this beautiful game. And this game doesn't require and doesn't expect anything with regards to age, ethnicity, gender, identification. All that matters in the game is that you're able to contribute to the overall good, that you're able to give to the team, you're able to adapt and improvise and overcome what is expected of those where, you know, maybe the referee made the wrong decision, right? You're able to overcome that for the overall good, which is the win, what we call the W. Now, this lack of barrier of entry into the game, it allows those who are, have that capacity to step into it and over, overcome the, the aspect of what you're able to do. Now, what one thing we would do is when I went from the, my playing days to my refereeing days, what there I had to see a different side of this beautiful game, a side that was unknown to me at that time point. Now, one thing going over and moving to that different perspective was that what I learned was that this game in itself still opened the doors for me. I had the unique ability as a referee to reach the highest level of certification in the world, a FIFA referee. Less than 1% of all soccer officials in the United States reached this certification. And it was an honor for me to become a FIFA referee and represent the United States on and off the field, both domestically and abroad. However, while I was being a FIFA referee along the process, I learned quite a bit about the game. A game that lacked a barrier entry as a player, I quickly learned that in the referee world, there were plenty of barriers and it was not accessible to everyone. And it was quite unfortunate when I learned that. At that time period in my 20s, while I was learning to become an attorney, I was being taught and advised on how to effectively be the advocate and voice for everyone in the courtroom, fight for the right for you to have a voice, be that voice that protects the judiciary system. At that same time of when I was receiving that education, I was also receiving an education in the referee world that I had no voice, that I needed to be quiet. Don't talk, stop asking questions. I ask a lot of questions. Um, you know, don't talk, referee, don't attract attention, don't ask for fair pay. We're not even talking about equal pay. Don't ask for fair pay. Don't ask for a better work condition as a referee. So essentially what they were asking me was to push aside all my values and everything that I've learned and what was my institutions, my core beliefs for achievement. To not use my platform to speak for others who I knew had no voice in that referee world. That axis prevented me and taught me much about the referee culture system that needed to be changed. One thing I do love in this referee world that we always state is control the controllables. And in that referee world where we didn't, where we, I was always chalked up to the fact that, hey, this world is toxic. It didn't matter who I was. It, essentially, that world, it didn't matter who I was or what I achieved. I didn't matter, 
The people before me didn't matter, and the referee that was coming after me didn't matter. And this was an area and environment that's not just prone to soccer officials, but to all officials across all sports and all cultures. And here, when I would ask every single time, why are we, why are we operating like this? Why are we toxic? They would just say, it's just the cost of doing business. This is how we always have done it, which blew my mind. Because those were fatally flawed thoughts and explains why we are where we are, which I will explain here shortly. And as Adam Grant recently just stated, we laugh at those who use Windows 95. However, we hold and cling dearly to opinions that are formed in 1995. And the referee world is not a stranger to that. So that's why I love this control the controllables. Because what I can't control are those who have a platform and a voice in the sports world, who are making a statement or a tweet about referee abuse and hatred towards referees and how we should treat those referees, not at the highest professional levels, but even at the grassroots levels of youth sports and how we scream and we berate them. And they're saying these things for a laugh or a click or a retweet. Or we have a prominent athlete here in the United States condemning the, uh, the fans for throwing water bottles and food at his, what he thought was his players, and then learning from the staff and the media in that press conference, oh, no, no, they were throwing it at the referees. His response, good, I'm glad that they were doing. I can't control that. But what I can control now is in my position now as a referee administrator, I have the ability to control those 1995 opinions. I have the ability to control those values that have established a referee industry that are fatally flawed. The medical industry has this, takes the sacred Hippocratic Oath, do no harm. In our referee world, we also have a high level of ethical standard, the safety of the players. Now, it is my job to take those values of respect and access and to bring those into the modern referee world to ensure and establish that we as well do not end up in this referee crisis that we are in. The modern referee ecosystem, we as officials have failed systemically to create a referee ecosystem that keeps up with the modern demand of the game. It is a modern game. If no one's been watching, we have VAR and all that technology. So I know some of those hate VAR. I'm a fan of VAR. I'm going to put that on the record. But this modern referee ecosystem that we have failed as a referee system in our institution did not keep up with the game. The modern game requires a modern referee. And by effect, that modern referee requires that modern referee ecosystem. And because we have failed to evolve as an institution and an organization, we are now everyone's problem. In 2020, the D3 Commissioners Association recognized that we were having a referee shortage and crisis. And this was propounded by two things. The advanced age of the current officials who are getting ready to leave the officiating uh, system in the next two or three years, as well as a lack of interest in officiating by younger populations to even enter or remain the officiating scene. And as we've seen on TV and on social culture, you can't blame them. It's one of the hardest professions to have, and it's not treated with respect. Those two things stimulated the D3 Commissioners Association to hire the PICTOR group to do a year-long study to determine how we have a referee crisis and shortage in this component. And what was central to that strategic plan were these decision-driving values, these value statements to help create an organization and a procedure and platform that puts these values in core central to allow us to be able to deliver an infrastructure, that right, which is respect, diversity and inclusion, integrity, and excellence. Broken down and more simplified, the PICTOR's analysis basically told us all referees what we already knew about the referee ecosystem that it was toxic, that there was no culture to it, that there was no way to go beyond and beyond. It was inaccessible. There were barriers to it. But what this PICTOR study group did was provide a framework and a groundwork that established a doing good with core beliefs to reverse this toxic culture. Now, what cannot be missed here is that we had a well-established institution, a stakeholder, invest in essentially determining from its personal as well as financial resources to solve this crisis of the refereeing officiating shortage. That cannot be missed in all that we do here. Now, one of the main components of taking the strategic framework and path forward is how do we make this organization better? And what many people don't know is that the referee ecosystem is developed and impacted, that referee is developed and impacted by four main critical component, uh, components in it. They are the assessor, the instructor, the assigner, and the administrator. 
The assessor is what it sounds like. Yes, you go and we do get you know, evaluated and determined and we get points and we get scores. This can be formal and this can be informal, but this is the on-job training of the official at that time point. The instructor is what you would think. It's a classroom session. We do, contrary to popular belief, we don't just roll out of our car and officiate your game. We do on the weekends spend time and sacrifice time that we are not compensated for to become better officials on the field and get this instruction, which is learning the laws of the game and the application of the game. The assigner. This is one of the most critical players in the referee ecosystem for the development of officials and the recruitment, retention, and the pipeline. The assigner is what you would think. They assign the matches on that game. However, they hold the keys to the kingdom, and it is one point in the referee ecosystem that has consistently been overlooked. And although we don't make a lot of money in this referee world, the assigner is the one who makes the most money. And last but not least, the administrator. Now, the administrator is primarily tasked with the oversight and the strategic plan of the referee education, development, pipeline, and ensuring that we have this line of officials. However, in the administrator component, there is no, uh, there is no financial compensation. 90% of this is volunteer basis. From everywhere, professional level is the only one it's typically being compensated at. So when people ask why we have a referee crisis and a referee shortage, it's because we have no investment. We have a toxic culture. And until we have well-established institutions and stakeholders taking a look at this issue, which is already past the crisis threshold, we're not gonna fix what it is that we need to fix. And until we all culturally step into this referee culture, not just in soccer, but in all sports together, once we fix our culture, we will then be able to have referees on the game and not just cover the games but have qualified officials stepping onto those matches, which naturally results in safety of the players, enjoyment by the spectators and fans. Yes, you guys will still yell at us, we get it. But there'll be a little bit more enjoyment into that game. So I ask you here today, and one of the things that I have always stated is that I share the same common core beliefs and standards that Socrates has when he states, the unexamined life is one not worth living. Well, I've examined the referee ecosystem. And the definition of crazy is doing the exact same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. And it's, two th it's what is it, 2022 now? And we are still doing things as we did in 1995. So there is one statement that I love from Toni Morrison which states, if there's a book you wanna read but has not yet been written, you must be the one to write it. Well, I am here today and I am ready 